the uh, evening's topic, as you know, uh, is the United States and uh, global leadership in the 21st century. This is a absolutely fundamental theme within the consideration of American affairs. Uh, it's not new to us. George Washington <laughs> had something to say about that in the farewell address. And uh, those who favored the exemplar tradition were dominant in the first half of the 19th century. We certainly have considered international institutions. And we all know that uh, once uh, weapons of mass destruction and nuclear uh, and, and delivery capabilities became part of our way of life. The isolationism of the, of the 1930s was weakened extraordinarily. And uh, while it may have been clear uh, what we pursued during the Cold War period, there has been something less than, than coherence, I think, since the end of the Cold War period. And that underlines the importance uh, of tonight's presentation and our reflections upon the topic. Now, I, I have to thank uh, uh, Dr. John Brothers of T. Rowe Price for implementing the possibility of this program. And for that implementation and making it possible, we, we certainly thank him. T. Rowe Price is a wonderful supporter of this council. They've been a corporate member since 1980, one of our major supporters. Um, they still are. Uh, we're, in, we're in debt to them. And uh, Dr. Brothers is the uh, I believe I'm correct, the chairman of charitable giving at T. Rowe Price, and he will introduce our speaker, Dr. Brothers. So, so what, one thing I've noticed is that it's cold outside, right? right. But actually for Minnesotans like me and Jake, this is shorts weather. So, um, so the, the phrase that's commonly uh, thrown around when you talk about Minnesotans is this thing called Minnesota nice. And so it's important to understand what that phrase means when you interact with us Minnesotans. Anybody in here from Minnesota other than me and Jake? There you go. And you seem perfectly nice. So, so the first thing is that Minnesotans are, they, they have a, they're polite and friendly, um, but they don't like prolonged, um, too much public display of affection, right? So it's a hug and then, then we're off. Uh, we do not like confrontation, right? We try to avoid it at, at all costs. Uh, we have a tendency uh, towards understatement. Most Minnesotans, we, there's one um, Minnesotan prince uh, that, is, that holds all our overstatement, or held all of our overstatement. Uh, we don't like to make a fuss or stand out. Uh, we're pretty emotionally restrained. Um, and we're pretty modest and, and have an ease in criticizing ourselves. So, so that's, those are pretty standard Minnesotan traits. Um, so I uh, knew Jake in high school. Um, he was a couple years younger uh, than, than I was, and quite honestly, I haven't seen Jake since, uh, since high school, but he's been pretty busy from what I hear. Um, but when I knew him, um, we were on student council together. Um, and he was, you know, he did a number of really great things in high school, but when you are on student council with somebody who has the career that Jake is, has, you personally feel like, well, maybe I had something to do with that. And so I take full credit for his success. Um, and I know my mentorship was everything to him in, in his life. So, so a little bit about that success. So. Uh, Jake has spent a lot of his uh, academic career at Yale, both in, as a ba uh, in, in getting his bachelor's degree, but also getting um, his law degree. He was also a Rhodes Scholar, um, where he studied international relations. Uh, obviously, that's, that's been uh, a theme for him at the University of Oxford, where he became the managing editor of the Oxford International Review. Um, he, while he was at uh, Yale Law School, he was the editor of the Yale Law Journal and the Yale Daily News. Um, and then did some work at Brookings and uh, the Yale Center of Study for Globalization. So you'll notice there's lots of Yale there, so I think he's probably a bulldog through and through. Um, so after his studies, um, he um, clerked for the Second Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Guido Calabresi and Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, Stephen Breyer, uh, then practiced and taught law. Um, at the University of St. Thomas, my alma mater, um, and then served counsel to Senator Amy Klobuchar uh, in Minnesota. So he emerged in the national scene, uh, in national politics, as an advisor uh, to Hillary Clinton, 
uh, during the 2008 uh, primary cycle and then Barack Obama during the presidential campaign. Uh, after Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State, he joined her as Deputy Chief of Staff and Director of Policy Planning, traveling with her to j over uh, 112 countries. Um, uh, do you get to keep those miles? No, that's too bad. <laughs> then I'd really be saddling up next year. So after her departure from state, he became Vice President Biden's National Security Advisor before leaving to teach at Yale Law School. Um, among other policy matters, he was deeply involved in the negotiations of the Iran uh, nuclear program, uh, and then during the 2016 presidential campaign, he was the chief foreign policy advisor to Hillary Clinton. Uh, and currently, he's back at Yale as the Martin R. Flug visiting lecturer in law. Uh, and it's an honor and pleasure to see Jake again and introduce him tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you, Frank. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, I'm going to try to keep my opening remarks relatively informal and as brief as I possibly can. Um, although Minnesotans aren't known for uh, speaking at great length, Irish people are, and <laughs> as a Sullivan. Um, I will say one other thing, which is that both Minnesotans and Irish people share uh, a common trait that William Butler Yeats described. We have an abiding sense of tragedy that sustains us through temporary periods of joy. <laughs> and so, for, by my lights, last night was a, was a good outcome. Um, so we're in this temporary period of joy, but I'll try to, yeah, thank you. But, but I'll try to re-inject some tragedy into the picture um, here by the time everybody leaves this evening. So the subject for tonight's talk was the United States and global leadership in the 21st century. Uh, but I want to take it down from the theoretical, uh, the academic, to a really practical assessment of the past year and what lies ahead. Uh, because Donald Trump's election, and by the way, Donald Trump has now been president for less than one year, which is kind of extraordinary. It, it leads me to believe that we are going to start measuring presidential years in dog years, given how long it feels like it's been, more like seven years. Um, but his election and then uh, his inauguration, and the speech he gave at the inaugural, the remarks that he made on the campaign trail over the course of the past couple years, represented a kind of fundamental challenge to the view of America's role in the world that Democrats and Republicans had shared going back several decades. And I think it's important for us to take stock now at the end of 2017, when you look at some of the core challenges he posed, some of the premises of American leadership and American foreign policy that he questioned, to, to take a look to see what does the scorecard actually look like after a year, and then what can we expect as we look ahead to 2018. So the first significant challenge that Donald Trump posed to American foreign policy was taking the notion that alliances, uh, the treaty alliances that the United States has relied on, a network, a global network of them since the end of the Second World War, bring more burdens than benefits. They're not really worth it, that other countries are taking from us that in the words of Donald Trump, they're laughing at us. If there was one phrase that he's used over and over again, again, across 30 years in his career, it's that they're laughing at us. Other people are taking and we're giving. What's been interesting to watch over this, the course of this past year is that there's been a sharp distinction between the way that Donald Trump has carried forward his approach to alliances in Asia and in Europe. You see, in Europe, he looks at European small d Democrats as essentially the equivalent of American big D Democrats. They're kind of annoying liberals who whine at him about things like climate change and refugees and fair growth, and he just doesn't like dealing with them. Culturally, he has no affinity for them. Which is why, even though his aides keep writing into his speeches things like a commitment to the Article 5 guarantee of mutual defense, whenever he gets a chance to go off script, he comes back to this basic proposition that our European alliances really aren't worth their salt. Meanwhile, in Asia, the picture looks quite a bit different. He has flirted with pulling out of the Korea Free Trade Agreement. He's, he's questioned whether, in fact, we should be paying for the missile defense system in South Korea. But fundamentally, he's been committed to our Asian alliances. 
He's spoken forcefully about them, even when not scripted. He's developed a good relationship with Abe. And I think the reason for this is basically because North Korea has focused the mind. It's made him see in Asia that actually having allies, coordinating with allies, being based uh, on the territory of allies is critical to America's national security. So on this issue, you actually see a more mixed picture than one might have expected when this, uh, when this year began. The second issue is the role of values, human rights, and the support for promotion of democracy in American foreign policy. We have certainly imperfectly practiced our values in our foreign policy, and different presidents have taken different approaches. But every president, Republican and Democrat, going back really all the way to Woodrow Wilson, has had something to say about a set of values and principles and norms that the United States stands for, believes in, and wants to step up and uh, press across the world. Again, the results of this have been uneven, but the basic commitment to an idea that we are not simply about naked self-interest is something real. It's there. It's there in conversations at the Situation Room table. It's there in the speeches of our presidents. And for Donald Trump, this is something completely alien and foreign. And I think that the scorecard here is extremely clear. Over the course of the past year, he has proven time and time again that he has an affinity for strong men and that the more authoritarian you are, the more likely he is to like you. And a big part of the reason for this, I believe, is because he looks at leaders like Xi Jinping or Erdogan from Turkey or Putin from Russia and thinks, I want what you have, you know? <laughs> like, would that I could exercise the same dominion over this country that you do over yours. I mean, this is a guy who comes into the White House thinking it's going to be kind of like becoming the CEO of America and quickly realizing that actually it's a lot more complicated than that. And so you almost physically see him failing to understand why is it that I can't just say so and everything happens this way? Why do I have to deal with the Congress? Why do I have to deal with the intelligence community? Why do I have to deal with the press? Now, the interesting thing about this is that in throwing his lot in with the Sisi's and the Mohammed bin Salman's and the Putin's and the Xi's and the Erdogan's, what Trump has done is really, I think, much graver damage to the prospect of the United States continuing to stand for that set of values or advance that set of values in the future beyond his term. There was recently an editorial in the, in the China People's Daily, which is one of the main mouthpieces of, of the Chinese Communist Party and the government, that talked about this interesting phrase, fake news, lifted from Donald Trump. And they said, you know, when the American president says that all of this Western media is fake news, he's proving China's point, that complaints about political prisoners and all these other things are made up. They're BS from the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar to the crackdowns in Cambodia and the Philippines to Putin's <laughs> assaults on journalists in Russia, all of them are adverting to this concept of fake news as an argument for why they no longer have to worry about hectoring or lecturing or any other kind of pushing from the West. And I think that the long-term impact of this is going to be quite significant. And if I haven't, if I've understated it, I think that is significantly bad, <laughs> significantly negative uh, in terms of our ability to uh, project something beyond the mere proposition of power, something that has the chance to inspire or to galvanize uh, in support of a better life for people, more human dignity, more freedom. Um, again, you know, something we've not always been the best at being consistent on, but something that has been a critical feature of American leadership over the course of the past several decades. The third issue that, uh, that, that Trump challenged in terms of core American leadership is essentially rejecting the whole idea of multilateralism. He believes we should only deal bilaterally with other countries. That's how a deal maker does things. You deal one-on-one, -on -one, you look the other leader in the eye, preferably that leader is a man, so you don't have to deal with too many women, uh, and you work it out. That's Trump's basic view. 
And if you look at his, one of his early moves, he pulls out of the Paris Climate Agreement and basically says, look, you know, this is impeding U.S. sovereignty. Why are we signing up for this international agreement where we have to take certain actions? This is nonsense. I'm not into it. He pulls out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and I'll bet there's a, a difference of opinion in this room about whether the TPP was a good thing or a bad thing. But instead of thinking, how do I replace this with some other multilateral framework that will lift up the rules of the road on trade and investment in Asia, he says, I just want to do a bunch of bilateral deals out there. In the transition, he sent a team of people to Germany to ask the Germans if they could do a bilateral deal, U.S.-Germany, a trade deal. And the Germans explained to this delegation, actually, there's this thing called the European Union that Germany is a part of. And that actually Brussels is the one who handles trade negotiations. And, and the Trump delegation was like, what are you talking about? You know, what is this? Why? Well, let's just do the deal. And it, it goes to show this underlying feature of his foreign policy. And honestly, a big part of the reason why he supported Brexit is because his view on multilateralism is not just about what constrains the United States. It's like, why would the UK ever be engaged in some larger multilateral project in Europe? That makes no sense. And he promised the Brits, and I think this had some impact on their thinking, the Conservative Party's thinking, don't worry, the minute you're out, the US and the UK will do a trade deal and it'll be great. And I think the UK has finally come around to learning that the fabulous trade deal Donald Trump has promised them is not going to materialize. And they're trying to figure out uh, how they take their own next steps. And this kind of then ladders up to the fourth fundamental issue, which is Trump's basic attitude on what American leadership is or means. And Frank made the point in his opening that we had a certain clarity about this in the Cold War, for good and for bad. Uh, but since the end of the Cold War, we've had a little bit of a hard time figuring out what exactly is American leadership all about? What is the fundamental purpose and thrust of our foreign policy? In the 90s, we were sort of riding on the, the wave of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Then September 11th, 2001 comes, and we sort of think, oh, we found it. We found our new purpose. It's the global war on terror, and then quickly realize that that has a kind of warping and distorting effect. So here we are back in a way searching for a kind of basic purpose about what American leadership's all about. But even through all that uncertainty, there has been a fundamental proposition that I think leaders of both parties have stood by. It is a, it is a positive sum proposition. It says that even though America can exercise immense power in the world, that we are stronger, safer, and more prosperous when others are also stronger, safer, and more prosperous. So we police the sea lanes not to kind of hold others down, including, by the way, vanquished adversaries like Germany and Japan, but to try to help create conditions of stability for them to build up. The remarkable rise of China over the last 40 years, I was in Beijing last week, politely reminding my, my Chinese hosts of this, is, yes, fundamentally about the ingenuity and drive of the Chinese people, but the conditions that allowed them to rise the way they have are fundamentally about a stable Asia-Pacific region underwritten by American investments in material and economic power. And so it's not, an, it's not the failure of American policy that China has risen. It is the natural outcome of a positive sum mindset. Donald Trump comes at this and says, again, they're laughing at us. Zero sum mindset. If someone else is doing well, that means they're doing well at our expense. There was a remarkable piece in the Wall Street Journal a few months ago written by Gary Cohn and H.R. McMaster, the president's economic advisor and his national security advisor. And, and it's, parts of it are just like imprinted on my brain. I don't normally take to quoting Wall Street Journal op-eds from memory, but this was so striking to me. They say in this piece, we reject the notion that there's any such thing as a, quote, global community. What there is are nations and businesses competing for advantage. We don't deny this elemental state of affairs, we embrace it. Basically a dog-eat-dog -dog world, where American leadership, American power should fundamentally be exercised in a zero-sum way for America first. Now, I think at the end of the day, if that became the basis upon which America exercised a leadership role in the world, we would all end up worse off. Because the basic problem, 
looking out there at the world, the major threats that we face, the threat of nuclear proliferation, the threat of climate change, the threat of pandemic disease, all of these are challenges that no one country can solve on their own, but all of them require a catalyst, a mobilizer, someone who can pull the world together to act. And really, the United States is the only country with the reach and resolve to be able to do that effectively. And I can tell you, again, having just been in Beijing, the Chinese have no, despite saying good things about Paris and, and trade regimes and so forth, they're fundamentally not interested in stepping into that exceptional role, that role that at its best helps make our people more prosperous and more secure and the same for the rest of the world. Now, we do have to do a better job of explaining in a domestic political context why this works for us, why these kinds of investments in internationalism are sensible and are not some kind of soulless globalism, which is a way the debate has been cast recently. I worked for Hillary Clinton on the campaign, and, and I saw up close and personal the ways in which people are questioning, why is it that we do what we do in the world? I was at an event in Ohio in 2015, and I made the mistake in the, in the context of the Q&A of um, using the phrase liberal international order. You know, we, we've got to defend the liberal international order. And someone came up to me after the talk and said, I don't know what that phrase means, but I don't like any of those three words. <laughs> And I thought, OK, well, maybe I should figure out how to make this case in a little bit of a more effective way. Now, because this is Trump's view, because he doesn't see the positive sum investment, the role of the United States in helping to catalyze and mobilize cooperation on these big challenges as fundamentally in our interest, he doesn't do it. And this is something you don't see as much the, the degradation, the atrophy in the international system, the chickens are going to come home to roost on this quite a bit further down the line. So for example, he shows up at the G20 in Berlin with all of the other major leaders of the world. Normally, an American president is there with some ideas, some thoughts. Here's what we got to do. Here's, what, here's how we move the ball forward. Trump basically goes and says, you know, I've got nothing to do here. On the big issues of our time, what are we going to do about establishing norms in cyberspace? What are we going to do about taking the Paris commitments to the next level? What are we going to do to establish a global health monitoring system that can stop a pandemic from sweeping across the United States? How are we going to secure loose nuclear materials that could fall into the hands of terrorists and represent a genuine threat to an American city? These are all issues that require the United States to be on its front foot, not to be kind of arms folded sitting at the back. And that is something you won't see the results of or the, or the consequences of immediately, but they will come. Now, as Trump has executed on his foreign policy, he has recognized, as I said, in, in the context of autocrats and authoritarians, th that he's constrained by some things. He's constrained to a certain extent by his advisors. Uh, some of whom have pushed him hard to do things he did not want to do. He has maintained a troop presence in Afghanistan against his own very deeply felt instincts because basically the military <laughs> pushed him into it. He is constrained to a certain extent by Congress. He wanted to lift the sanctions on Russia and be done with it, and Congress came along and said, not, not so fast, mister, and passed new sanctions in a kind of an extraordinary uh, bipartisan move. Uh, and he's been constrained to some extent so far so far by reality. Uh, you know, John mentioned that I worked on the Iran deal, which we can talk about some in the Q&A. So it's, a, it's an issue I care deeply about. And following closely, Trump really wanted out of this thing, uh, but felt he could only go so far as decertifying, which is a kind of technical move, but couldn't actually follow through on reimposing the sanctions because I think he, he recognized, his team recognized, at least for the moment, that that would put the United States in an extremely dangerous situation. Now, will that hold? Will that hold? That's a big question because having taken that survey of 2017 and where we stand in terms of the president's attitude towards American leadership, we can now look ahead to 2018. The House and Senate just announced today that they've basically arrived at their, at their agreement in principle on the, this tax bill. And it looks like they're going to pass it uh, before Christmas. After the tax bill, there is no next item 
on the president's legislative domestic agenda. What's next? Normally, you might think infrastructure comes next, but of course, we've just spent all the money, uh, 1.5 trillion. Uh, so there's not going to be a significant infrastructure bill. There is 2018 coming with a kind of blank space opening up in terms of any kind of affirmative domestic agenda. When you combine that with the accelerating pace of the Mueller investigation, the recent results of elections in 2018 looming and the political pressure the president feels, I believe there will be a natural tendency by this White House and this president to look abroad so that he doesn't have to deal with Congress, so that he can score some wins from a political perspective, and so that, frankly, he can kind of fill his calendar because there isn't a next big domestic move. And I, I think there, this Iran is, a, is one area, I think, where we have to be very concerned about how things may play out. As we speak now, American troops and Iranian troops and Iranian proxies are operating in close proximity in Syria. American ships and Iranian ships are operating in close proximity in the Persian Gulf. And there's a general ethos or attitude within this administration, which will only be hardened if, as is reported, Tillerson leaves, Pompeo moves to state, and Tom Cotton becomes CIA director, a hawkishness, a bellicosity specific to Iran that could easily lead to a mistake, a miscalculation, an incident that then escalates out of control. Or the president could decide you know what, I didn't get enough bang for my buck out of decertifying my new plan. We're pulling out of the Iran deal. Iran turns around and says, all right, we're restarting our centrifuge production. And all of a sudden, the United States is thinking, okay, do we have to take military action to stop that? These are all distinct risks in 2018. And I think we should watch that space very carefully. But we can't watch that space exclusively, of course, because there's this other small nuclear issue on the other side of the world, uh, North Korea. Two propositions this administration has made on North Korea that both point in the direction of potential military action. The first is that Kim Jong-un does not want these weapons for defensive purposes. He wants them for offensive purposes. You see, there's a kind of view in the expert community that this is about regime preservation, about protecting himself and defending North Korea. Senior people inside the Trump White House reject that view and say, no, we cannot count on that. He is, there's, a, there's a chance he uses them against us or has them sitting there to be able to take offensive action against South Korea. Therefore, we have no choice. Eventually, we are going to have to take military action. The second proposition is that we can manage escalation that we can take military action in North Korea and keep North Korea from reacting in the ways that the experts expect they will, which is to hold 20 plus million people in Seoul at risk uh, with conventional rocketry, missiles, and the like. There are people inside this administration who say, no, I think, I, I think we can uh, avoid that. I think we can hit them and tell them, uh, you better not hit back because otherwise we'll, we'll crush you. When you put those two things together, if you believe those two things, you can manage escalation and Kim Jong-un wants these for offensive purposes, the case for war just got a lot stronger. Now, we're in an interesting moment right now where Tillerson has actually gone out, and I can't tell whether he did it freelancing or actually has the support of the White House and has said, I'm prepared to talk with no preconditions with North Korea. We have a window here, and the, the Olympics are coming up. You've got a lull in, in uh the exercises the U.S. and South Korea do, where perhaps a third option, a diplomatic option, could open up. But we have to be ready for the possibility that Kim Jong-un continues testing, and that then this question gets put squarely to President Trump with advisors actually making the case, do it. You could do it. So I think 2018 is a year where there is also a distinct possibility of military action with respect to North Korea. And finally, on trade. You know, it's been interesting. Trump in, in 2017, I think a lot of people thought he'd make some significant move on trade, flex his muscles, show that he's not going to be pushed around. And he clearly wants to. He goes around the White House saying, I got to pull out of something. And TPP wasn't enough. So talk of initiating the process of withdrawing from NAFTA, talk of withdrawing from the Korea Free Trade Agreement talk even of pulling out of the WTO. 
we have to watch all of those spaces as well in 20, 2018 as he sort of thinks, what cards do I have to play heading into a midterm? And of course, in the U.S.-China relationship, we have investigations pretty far along that could result in adverse trade actions against China, and we could see that also escalating. So I think from the perspective of what to look out for in the major risks in 2018, you have both the possibility of significant economic moves and significant military moves uh, that have the potential to create a substantial amount of instability in the system. Now, perhaps the most fundamental question, and I'll just close with this, that we are facing, uh, those of us who work on foreign policy and national security, those of us who care about it, is does Trump represent an aberration, a detour from a kind of long-term bipartisan commitment to a principled American foreign policy, a leadership role in the world? Or does he represent a sign of the times of, of what's to come? I will say that I think the Democratic Party was probably headed for a pretty uh, feisty debate if Hillary Clinton had been elected president over the nature of America's role in the world with real divides inside the Democratic Party. Trump has had an interesting impact from the far left to the center in the Democratic Party. You got basically everybody saying, we like alliances, we care about values, we care about America actually being respected and not embarrassed in the world. So in a way, Trump has forced a return to first principles that I think has reinforced the foundation for a kind of uh, principled internationalism. Now, now, this does not mean there won't be debates over particular policy issues, but I do think that uh, there is a reasonable chance that there will be consensus heading into the 2020 primaries around some fundamental, some fundamental principles of the sorts of things that I've just been talking about. But at the end of the day, we will not succeed if we simply say, you know, everything we were doing before was great. Trump's challenge that we just need to put, push back and go back to how we were doing things. Plainly, you can look around the world and see. And you can look at the condition of our economy here at home and income inequality, where jobs of the future are going to come from, the hollowing out of the middle class, and say, we need to do better in our foreign policy. And there are things that we can talk about in the Q&A from my perspective that we can do in that regard. But fundamentally, the answer cannot simply be Trump's wrong and we're totally right. It's got to be Trump's wrong. Uh, but, but we need to think about what has been unearthed in this debate over America's role in the world that requires an adjustment, a calibration, a rethinking about how we exercise our leadership and power in the world. And that's something that I'm very much focused on now as I reflect back on my time in government and think about the possibility of serving again. I'll just close by saying, I, as, as John mentioned, I went to 112 countries with Hillary Clinton, uh, just shy of a million miles, didn't get to keep a single frequent flyer mile. <laughs> Although I made a pitch that if you hit a million miles that you get a free flight on a government jet anywhere in the world, like that should be some kind of rule. I think the Trump administration's just doing that, you know, just, just maybe they heard that from me or something. So, right, yeah, you don't, you don't need any miles to, to, to take the jet. Um, but I have to tell you, you know, Four years, a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of pressure, and a lot of different difficult portfolios. But, you know, when you go to that plane that's got the blue and white plane with the United States of America on the side, the American flag emblazoned on the back, wherever we went, I really did feel, whatever our mistakes and shortcomings, wherever we have, there's a gap between our principles and our action, Underlying all of that is still a fundamental positive purpose, a force for good in the world. And I felt always serving the United States like I could be a part of that. And, and you know, one of the things I worry the most about with Donald Trump is the way that he's eroding that sense of inspiration among young people in the State Department and elsewhere. And we have to hold on to that as a country. It's one of our greatest assets, the belief that we can help ourselves and others do better, be better, and that's something that I remain fully committed to, even with uh, this person in the White House. And 
it's in that spirit that I'm here before you tonight, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I start off with a really easy question. <laughs> so the question uh, for those of you who didn't hear it was, if Hillary Clinton were in the White House and, and I was advising her and North Korea had just proven uh, a nuclear-tipped ICBM capability, whether an atmospheric test or a full flight test with re-entry, what, what would my advice be to her? I would argue that, first of all, um, you've got to back up and say, uh, once you start thinking the military option is a truly viable option, I think you take your pedal off of stopping us from getting to that point in the first place. You sort of say, well, we can try diplomacy kind of, but who really cares because at the end of the day, we're just going to whack them. And I worry a little bit that that thinking has, has affected the approach so far to how this administration has gone at it. So from the start, I would have been working pell-mell towards trying to avoid an outcome that is acquiescing in North Korea having this capability on the one hand or having to go to war to stop them, the bomb or the bombing. But I would further argue that if North Korea actually uh, did a, a full flight test, showed the reentry vehicle, that you never take the military option entirely off the table and you need to consider the nature of the threat as it evolves. But my first stop would not be to argue to the president that we go into North Korea for two reasons. Number one, our intelligence has been so poor that we've missed by years how quickly North Korea could get to this capability in the first place. So why do we believe that our intelligence could show us all the places across North Korea that its missile capability is distributed so that we could actually get it? And then, of course, number two, what I referred to earlier, the potential for the devastation that could rain on uh, Seoul and South Korea where you've got hundreds of thousands of U.S. citizens and 28,000 serving American troops in harm's way is an incredibly significant factor. I don't think it's right to say to the president, you can never do it, and obviously there would be circumstances in terms of an imminent threat to the homeland where I'd consider it, but my first move would be to think about, okay, they've done that, but now what steps can we take working with the rest of the world to try to abate, reverse, reduce that threat, and I'd make a big push on that before I ever got to thinking very hard about um, actually proceeding with military action. So the question is, uh, assuming we end up uh, having a, a Democrat come into office and Trump leaving, um, uh, <laughs> You know, what does the repair work actually look like at that point? Uh, I'd start with this observation. I think the difference between one term of Donald Trump and two terms of Donald Trump from the perspective of America's role in the world is not the difference between 1x and 2x, but 1x and 10x or 20x. Because, you know, I think a lot of people looked at this election and really thought, wow, America can do that. You know, that really shook their confidence. Now, if we come back around and say, that was an error, that was a mistake, okay, we can, I think our repair work is not going to be easy, but it will be easier. If we reelect Donald Trump, I think people will basically say, okay, that's that. That's the United States. That, that is not an aberration. It's not an anomaly. It's not some set of flukes coming together uh, in a given moment. So for one thing, I think that, that that has to be a part of the thinking as we go forward. Beyond that, we have some experience with this at a different level. I mean, I objected very much to the Bush foreign policy. I think I object significantly more to the Trump foreign policy. But our standing among our allies, particularly in Europe, took a very severe beating over the Iraq war and other issues. And when Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State, one of our first trips was to Brussels. And I remember walking in the door, and the, and the hallways were literally lined with people cheering as she came in. And of course, you remember Obama during the campaign going to Germany and having 200,000 people come out into the streets saying, you know, this is America, this is the America we want. So some of it I do think will happen by natural exercise of, you know, 
just the, the, the common exhale, particularly in Europe. It's interesting, Europeans right now um, are kind of hoping this is a detour or an aberration, and they're sort of thinking, okay, this is all gonna go away at some point. So they're sort of ready for a restoration. I think the picture in Asia is actually a little bit different. I think there, things are moving much faster. The, the rise of China, more significant, other actors beginning to play more significant roles. And so I actually believe proving that the United States has staying power there is more than just saying, hey, we're not the other guy. It will require a more consistent and persistent set of investments over time. And it worries me that, that we are ceding ground to China in ways that will be hard to make back up. And I don't mean that in a kind of Cold War tit-for-tat way. I mean that in terms of being able to continue to advance the rules-based order in the Asia-Pacific that, that benefits us and everyone else. So I feel like the picture is a little easier to, to think through how it plays out in Europe. And the spade work we will have to do in Asia is much more significant. Yeah. The question was, um, what happened to white America, and in particular, the Republican Party, uh, white voters in the Republican Party, that have made them see Russia not as an adversary, not as somebody we need to compete with, but somehow as a positive or someone they can do, you know, that they can turn a blind eye to their election intervention and all the rest. Um, how did this come to pass? Well, how are we in this circumstance? And, and just to put a fine point on it, if you look at approval ratings of Vladimir Putin among Republicans in the United States, they will stun you. I mean, he's over a 50% approval rating in certain surveys with, with respect to Republicans. So why is this? It goes back to Putin himself. So Putin goes to bed at night and wakes up in the morning thinking about one thing, how do I stay in power? And a big part of staying in power for him is discrediting the model of the West. And also in, in creating an identity for himself as the champion of traditional values. So how does that manifest itself? Well, that's why he's going around destabilizing democracies everywhere so he can say to his people, see, that system doesn't work so well. So let's keep this bargain going where I'm strong and safe and, and secure and stable for you. And then, he says, I will be the great white Christian defender of traditional values. And I have sat in the room with very senior Russian officials who just were sort of advancing an openly homophobic agenda at the behest of Vladimir Putin, who say to the United States in a way, um, we should have common cause against the other. The Muslims, who represent a threat to all of us. China, who's going to represent a threat to all of us. And, and I think Steve Bannon and Donald Trump and a lot of right-wing Republicans look at Putin and think, this is a guy standing up for our tribe, for us, against them. And that that's a very powerful factor. It's why Putin has become a kind of shibboleth, particularly in the white nationalist community, but now it's spilled over. Then you take on top of that another form of tribalism, which is the political tribalism that we have now, which is like, you know, even though the result in Alabama was good, uh, a significant majority of white voters in Alabama, including college-educated white voters in Alabama, voted for Roy Moore, who has been accused of pedophilia because pulling that lever for the Republican is just like, that's the jersey you wear, that is the vote you cast. So when you put those two things together, the nature of partisanship in the United States with the particular niche Putin is filling from a kind of ethno-cultural perspective, this is the result you get. And it's, I mean, it's really remarkable. The party of Ronald Reagan, you know, in a way becoming the party of Vladimir Putin. Crazy. Yeah. So the question is, with, with respect to the Iran nuclear deal, what steps do we need to take now to address the issue of the sunset clauses, uh, the expiring provisions of the agreement over the next 10 or 15 years uh, to make sure that we continue to keep Iran's nuclear program in a box? Uh, just a little bit of background. So I uh, was responsible for opening the secret channel uh, with Iran in the Gulf country of Oman in the summer of 2012. Um, had the first series of meetings there, 
to explore whether we could get a bilateral negotiation between the U.S. and Iran that ultimately was moved into the P5 plus one process, the world powers process that resulted in, in the agreement in the summer of 2015. Uh, so I have had a deep investment in the establishment of the diplomacy and then the negotiation of the actual agreement itself. And I will tell you, I think the agreement is achieving its purposes, but of course it is not a perfect agreement. There are things that we can do to strengthen it. Now, Donald Trump went around on the campaign trail saying it was the worst deal ever negotiated in human history, which if true is quite a remarkable achievement because human history has been very long and there have been a lot of deals. And if I actually had a real hand in negotiating the worst one ever, I mean, you know, it's not the distinction I necessarily want, but boy, that'd be historic. Um, I don't buy that, I don't agree with that. Uh, but one of the things that people point to is this, the, the so so-called sunset clauses. There is a view out there that after 10 or 15 years, Iran's just free to go get a nuclear bomb. And that's just not true. There is no sunset on Iran's permanent commitment not to seek weapons and its permanent commitment to accept inspections and to accept constraints on its weapons-related nuclear activities in, in perpetuity. And any time it violates any of that, we can come in like a ton of bricks. There are expiring provisions that relate to the issue of how many centrifuges they can have and, and the like. And we have to deal with those. We have to do something about that. My argument is, though, do not play games with the deal right now. Are we in or are we out? Commit to the deal and then go to our partners and say, now we sit down with the Iranians and work out what a supplemental or follow-on agreement would actually look like. Arms control agreements historically have involved an agreement and then another agreement and then another agreement. There was SALT 1 and then SALT 2. There was START and then, you know, while I was in the Obama administration, we negotiated New START. This is not an unusual notion, and it is certainly something that we could rally the world to bring to bear with respect to Iran. But what's happening instead? Instead, today, the rest of the world is worried more about the risk Washington poses than they are about the risk Tehran poses because we keep having this will he or won't he dance about staying in the agreement. And the Europeans are putting all of their energy into going up to Capitol Hill or calling our diplomats and saying, please don't pull out. What if they were putting all that energy into solving the exact set of issues you raised? How you work out some long-term understandings that make sure that Iran cannot advance its program in any threatening way, even when some of those provisions in the out years expire. I believe we are fully capable of doing this, but it requires committing to the agreement and then taking it from there. Yeah, at the back. The question was, uh, you know, you've made a logical case for uh, an informed, effective foreign policy. Hillary made a similar case, but she lost. Why'd she lose? And do you see Donald Trump as an unhinged, greedy narcissist, or do you see him as a clever, cunning politician because the, where you fall on that question has a big impact on how you see the next couple of years unfolding? Is that a fair? Um, so, uh, and I was saying, you know, Hillary has in great detail kind of walked through the main elements. Um, and and I, would, I would only add a couple of, of things, obviously, to that, that book. Um, Fundamentally, uh, 2016 was a year where a lot of people uh, wanted absolutely elemental change in our system on both the left and the right. And Hillary Clinton has been around a long time um, in Washington and was not seen as an agent of that change. I think at a base level, that, that was the foundation upon which everything else was built. Now, on top of that, there were a variety of things that happened, some of which were mistakes on her part, some of which were mistakes on the campaign's part, some of which were mistakes on third parties' parts, and then of course there was the Russian intervention as well. But I think at the end of the day, when you strip it all down, this was an election where people, whether it was drain the swamp or the system is rigged, looked at Hillary Clinton and basically said, that just represents too much of the same. And in a funny way, 2016 was a deferral of a debate this country did not have in 2012. So you have the financial crisis in 2008, 2007, 2008, 2009. But because President Obama ran against Mitt Romney, 
who was basically the vision of a corporate plutocrat, and there was no primary. There was never a debate over the system or over the financial crisis or anything about it. So you get this deferred debate many years later, and I think even Bernie Sanders was surprised by the ferocity of it. I mean, when he started running for president, he literally said, I'm running for president, but now I got to get back to the Senate, you know, just sort of like it was almost as though it was a lark. And then all of a sudden, he sees the groundswell. So I don't think anyone quite saw just how powerful this dynamic was going to be. But taking all the other factors into account, Comey and Russia and emails and, you know, the, the tactical mistakes, and I take responsibility as a senior member of the campaign team for those of the campaign, the picture is not complete without that basic, without that basic concept. Um, on the issue of what, what is Trump a genius, you know, is he crazy like a fox or is he just crazy really, I think is maybe a way to distill the question. This man defeated 16 Republican candidates for president and then defeated Hillary Clinton and won the presidency of the United States. So we all underestimate him at our peril. I very much believe that. On the other hand, I do not believe that he is a master wizard where each of these moves is calculated. You know, I was talking to David Frum not too long ago uh, who wrote this piece in The Atlantic that he's turning into a book about how Trump could usher in a more autocratic system here. And I asked him how he thought things were going several months in on this. And he said, you know, I thought that Trump might be greedy first and an authoritarian second. What I underestimated was that he would be needy first, greedy second, and an authoritarian third. And the neediness has gotten in the way of any kind of effective uh, leadership as president of the United States. And I think that that is a very fair observation. And I don't think that that is part of some big game plan. I think that that is from a deep psychological place. And it is very much getting in his way. Uh, and I think people are seeing through it. And, and, and what Virginia and New Jersey and Alabama all indicate, along with a lot of local elections from New Hampshire to Oklahoma, is that people are mobilized now in a different kind of way. So, and they've woken up to the deeply damaged aspects of Donald Trump's psyche and the damage that can do to our country. Uh, so that would, it's, it's not a direct answer to your question, but that would be my assessment of, of Trump. Is there any intelligent reason to move our embassy to Jerusalem at this time? I believe this was a purely political decision where it is difficult to see a diplomatic rationale of any kind, an upside, where we are advancing either the cause of peace or the cause of regional stability or America's role and reputation in the region, any of that. Uh, now, I do not buy the argument against it that says it you know, has massively set back the cause of peace between Israelis and Palestinians because having sat in the room with Bibi Netanyahu and Mahmoud Abbas, I am not persuaded that with these two leaders there is a real possibility of peace. However, there is a greater degree of quiet cooperation among some of the Arab states in Israel on common threats, which is to the good, both for regional stability, for Israel's security, and for the long-term prospects for peace. Moving the embassy to Jerusalem has disrupted that uh, in ways that, that I, you know, you can't, you can't look at this decision and see anything other than a basic calculus that this is good for Trump's base and so he decided to do it. And I think that that is unfortunate. The question is, uh, you know, you, in your remarks, you, you didn't talk very much about Afghanistan or Iraq where we've had troops now in Afghanistan for 16 years in Iraq for a little bit less and interrupted, but still for many years. Is there an exit strategy? What are we doing there? What is our long-term game plan? And, and what would Hillary have done? You know, uh, here was the case that, that Trump's national security team made to him. They basically said, if you pull all of the American troops out of Afghanistan, it will collapse. ISIS and Al-Qaeda will have a breeding ground and uh, this room and space to plot. And we'll be right back in there in force in a few years' time. So we're not going to win in Afghanistan. This is the argument. Uh, but we can not lose. We can basically 
roughly hold the country sufficiently together and have a platform to continue to suppress the growth of terrorist groups in the country. And there's a kind of indefinite quality to that logic and that proposition. So I don't see an exit strategy on the basis of the case that Trump's uh, national security team made to him. My own view is that this is one of those incredibly wicked problems, that the idea that after 16 years, America's longest war now, we still have troops in Afghanistan, is just deeply disturbing and distressing. On the other hand, I don't think that the military is making it up when they say, if you just pull the United States out in a precipitous fashion, that we're going to end up in a circumstance that's deeply challenging from the perspective of our counterterrorism missions. So how do you try to accelerate a glide path where you can actually say to the Afghans, OK, you've got to be able to step up and sustain this on your own? And I think that that's what Hillary would have worked towards. But it would have meant, as President Obama realized by the end of his term when he stopped the drawdown, it would have meant troops there for still some more years. And, and it's unfortunate to say that, but that is the world, I think, of, of the deep imperfections and imperfect choices that we face. And Afghanistan is, is, in that regard, an absolutely wicked problem. The question is, what pro uh, progress has the Trump administration made, made in the peace process between Israelis and Palestinians? Um, Jared Kushner appeared before the Saban Forum at Brookings a couple of weeks ago and said, over the next several months, we'll have a, a plan to put out. And you know we're confident we can start making progress. But it was sort of like, uh, watch this space, we'll tell you later. From my vantage point, there has been no progress in uh, uh, the efforts for peace between Israelis and Palestinians. And this Jerusalem thing is a setback. Now, a setback placed in proper context because I think the difficulty of actually arriving at an outcome are so great. Uh, but I just think we are in a position right now where our first priority has to be to preserve the possibility of a two-state solution in the future, not, not to obtain it today, because I think it is out of reach today, but to make sure that the, the prospect, the possibility, the horizon does not disappear on us. And I'm worried, from what I've seen so far from the Trump administration, that they are not sufficiently focused on achieving that goal. If I may make an observation, I think that the presentation has been uh, extraordinarily comprehensive, very clear, and I think whatever one's perspective may be, um, the, uh, the position you've taken is, is uh, put before everyone with uh, an appropriate uh, vigor. I, I found myself taking notes, and I suddenly realized it was time to end the program. <laughs> that doesn't happen every time. And uh, I think it's been a, a marvelous evening for, for everyone. I'm very, very sorry we don't have until 11 or 12 o'clock tonight, uh, <laughs> but we don't. And so we're going to simply have to thank our guests for a marvelous evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys.